uh, we'll, we've managed to uh, finally compile a team of the folks that you're going to see uh, hear from today on this call. This is going to be a little bit of a, we're going to be handing things down from me uh, next to, to the other um, uh, guys on the call today. Um, we've managed to actually have a team to be able to do this work and get something ready um, for everyone to be able to see and to be able to share it as an open data set that you'll be able to do some things with. So um, let me just, um, if we can flip over to the, the next slide. I'm just um, gonna have uh, a little bit or just a couple minutes on telling you what, uh, what PKP is for those of you that don't know. And again, I'm sure many of you here do, but so I'll try to keep it very short. Uh, the Public Knowledge Project, and we can just flip to the next slide. Um, the Public Knowledge Project is, uh, it's really a universe, as the name implies, it's a university uh, project. We are not an NGO, we're not a company, we're not a, a business of any kind, we're a university project that has us this mission and it has had it for more than 20 years uh, of uh, sort of improving the quality and the quantity of knowledge that is made public. Uh, but not just that, we've also been trying to do things with the goal of improving the the quantity and the quality of the participation in the creation of that knowledge. And so we, we're very proud of the work that we've been able to do and the, the reach that we have globally that has enabled uh, not just the people making their content and their scholarly content openly available, but uh, the, the, the places in the world where that, uh, that research is being coming, uh, has been able to come from, um, from areas that otherwise I think have been and uh, have not had that many outlets for being able to put their scholarship uh, online. Um, if we can just flip to the next slide, um, I think most of you are here as the as because you know our work uh, with open journal systems, and we are going to talk a lot about the, the the impact of that work for reasons that will become clear throughout this presentation. Uh, the uh, the the number the impact of o o OJS as as our work is is uh, has been large and is the thing that we've become best known for. But we do have other things that we do beyond uh, the software. So we have not just OJS, but o OMP, the monograph software, and more recently, a preprint software. Um, but we also do work in the area of research, education, and advocacy. And there we see uh, work uh, that we do around doing research around open access, around open science, around research metrics, economic models for OA, intellectual property, um, research incentives and career incentives, and all of those questions. Um, as well as providing online uh, courses and sort of the PKP school uh, and really kind of being advocates and a voice for the global context and conversations about scholarly communications. And so I think we do this advocacy work of advocating for this large community in fulfillment of those goals I mentioned earlier. And then the third pillar of work is some things that we do. We, have, we do have um, uh, publishing services that we offer. Um, hosting that we do as a cost recovery um, uh, mechanism, but we also have the uh, PKP preservation network and, and, and the metric services that we provide for free for our, for our community of users as well. So, so those services are something that we also take quite a bit of pride in. Um, let's just start with the, the brief overview of what we do. I obviously invite you to check out more things that we do at our, uh, on our website or to reach out to us. But for now, I'll pass it over to Alec, who will um, start telling you a little bit more about the, the subject of today's presentation and some of the history behind it. So Alec, over to you. Sure, thanks. Uh, Juan, do you want to do a round of uh, introductions before we go further? Maybe what your role is? Uh, of uh, introducing the other folks that are going to be presenting today? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, so next up is going to be Alex Metcher, who is uh, uh, a, the Associate Director of Development with the Public Knowledge Project and has worked on the project longer than I think at this point everyone, except for John, who's the founder, uh, John Walensky, who's the founder. Uh, he's also going to uh, be followed. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm going to get the order of all of this quite right, but I think then it's going to be uh, Jonas. Uh, who has been working with PKP for, I don't want to guess how many years, because I don't remember, but he's been working with PKP for some time. And then Saurabh, uh, who is, uh, well, uh, Saurabh and then John uh, Ball, who are both at Stanford University as uh, a graduate uh, students uh, working with John Walensky on, uh, on a few projects, but I've been working on this one for a little bit of time. So that's, that's a little bit the team that we've assembled. We've all been working on this particular project now for the last um, the last while, I'm, I'm hesitant to admit how long, uh, but, uh, but for now, let me just turn it over to you, Alec, to, um, to talk a little bit about that history. 
Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm uh, Alex Matcher. I'm the Associate Director of Development for PKP, which means that, uh, you know, 15 years ago, I was doing a lot of coding of OGS2 at that time, um, came on as the lead developer, and then gradually kind of shifted into more of a uh, stewardship role, managing the dev development team, uh, doing some community work. And this is one of these odd projects that uh, we've typically not been great at resourcing, but um, uh, is super interesting, and I hope you get a kick out of some of the results of it, which we'll get to shortly. Um, I'm not going to talk much about what OGS is, because I think if you're here, you probably already know some of that. But I want to show a few examples that will hope give you a sense of the reason this work to measure our community has been so difficult. Um, this is an example of one of our more kind of proximate journals. This is a, a journal hosted at the University of Victoria, which is very near to where I'm living. Um, and it's a typical institutional host. So the University of Victoria has a branded OGS installation that has a number of different journals. We talk with them, they work with us. Um, they do their own theming, they do their own hosting, but they're you know, a, a known quantity to us. They're, uh, they're a friendly group that we, we do speak with. Um, stepping a little bit further out, uh, this is a Ukrainian journal and um, we don't know much about them. We don't work with them. I don't recall, in fact, if this is institutional or not, um, but at least you can see that there's ISSNs, there's a, a title in English, and what looks like an OGS journal. Uh, going a bit further out yet, this is an Iranian journal, and um, I can say almost nothing about it, but to say that it's clearly not um, uh, something that we know much about. We, I can't read Iranian, um, and the title is not in English, there is at least an ISSN. Um, this might be institutional, it might not, uh, it might in fact be predatory, um, we do have a number of those out there. As soon as you move outside of our valences of community, you'll see that there's just a lot of variety out there and it's really hard to look at this and imagine incorporating statistics about who this is and what they do in a systematic way that will cover the breadth of our community, just because it's so varied and we don't have contact with them unless uh, we, we do some of this kind of a research outreach. Um, so some characteristics of the software um, that some of which you'll know, some which you might have, might not have thought about, is uh, primarily that it's distributed open source software. So as opposed to you know software as a service that you might see on GitHub, but that runs primarily as uh, as a software that's hosted by the the vendor, even though it might be open source, uh, our community is really distributed. So we don't know much about most of our users. Um, there's no registration required to download OGS. People will still use it. They might maintain it, they might not. They might contribute back to the community, they might not. Um, we just don't know much about who's out there. Um, they might be institutional, they might be a single journal, they might be a national installation, there's a number of those coming up. It might be an alternative use of OGS for something else. Um, it could be a monolingual journal, which is the most common case, or it could be multilingual, in which case um, the, uh, the, the journal titles, the journal metadata, the article titles, they might be in a mix of one, two, three, four different languages. Um, we have about, I don't know, approaching 40 translations that come with the software, and those are kind of crowdsourced so the community can benefit from those. But there are also proprietary translations, that is, translations that have been done by a single group and then not distributed. So we may not actually know anything about those translations, except that they have a, a language code that we can see when we harvest data from these installations. Um, there can be many of dozens of different releases, so a lot of folks will have the necessary skills to install OJS, but not necessarily to maintain it from there. So we'll see uh, software from 10 years ago that's still running more or less unmodified since then. There's also folks who modify their installations, uh, normally take the, um, the form of theming, which is the most common modification, but we do see um, wholesale changes to the code. We see some fairly major forks out there where people have taken and really modified the software and then left uh, the upgrade track because it becomes really difficult to do that once they um, customize the software beyond a certain point. Um, we see simple things like somebody who's gone in and rebranded the software so it's no longer open journal systems, which uh, is legal. It doesn't fill us with a ton of uh, pride <laughs> when we see people doing that. But uh, you, they may have actually gone out there to make it look as though it's not open journal systems. Um, and just to note, when I say open journal systems, I'm talking by proxy about open monograph press and open preprint systems. They operate in the same regard, um, but the OGS community is just so much larger, so it's really easy to speak about OGS more, uh, more broadly. Um, there's also a lot of test installations, uh, exploratory installations, things that might be ready to preparing to launch, but not, not quite public. Um, some might be behind a password protected um, uh, uh, control, especially things like works in progress or, um, or test installs. 
There's also a lot of uh, private network stuff that's not available from the outside. Um, and then there's subscription-based content where, of course, you won't have access to, um, to browse the content uh, freely. I mean, we support open access. That's our part of our mandate, but uh, we do support subscription journals as well. Long story short, it's really hard to gather information comprehensively about uh, these installations, and it's really hard to measure it consistently. Uh, oh, great. I've got a word on the Iranian example. It's at uh, a, a dental school, so it is institutional, and there is an English page there. So, great. <laughs> I learned something new already. Um, so, uh, talking about measuring our community and our first attempts to do that. Um, and this is going back to 1998. You know, I came on the project not long after that, um, I think around 2004 or so. And at that point, we were just scrabbling to get uptake with OJS. And so we would release the software. We'd know there were just a few journals out there looking at it. And we were trying really hard to secure uptake and to get folks to start using it. At that point, um, there was nothing to help us to measure community impact. Um, so we would do things like we would do Google searches for phrases that appear in OJS, like, you know, about this journal was a, a phrase that often just appeared in OJS journals and not so much elsewhere, or about this publishing system. Um, those are those types of things like looking at the referral URLs in the PKP logs where somebody would come from their OGS install to us and we would see where they came from or Google searches for those kinds of phrases. Those were useful for seeing when the community was small, you could do some uh, quantitative estimates. They're good for seeing qualitative because you can identify um, far flung examples, institutional hosts and so on. But as far as at this point, knowing anything about the, the number of the community, the size of it, uh, that was not useful at all. So going to 2015 um, and talking about the current beacon, uh, I'll get to the details of this in a second, but this is the overview slide for how um, this beacon feature works. And the beacon in short is a very, very minimal piece of telemetry between OJS, OMP, OPS and the PKP website. And uh, telemetry is a, a very contentious subject in, um, in open source software. So hopefully what I can do is present what we've decided to do and show you the compromises we made in collecting the data to also protect privacy and make sure that there's opt-in, opt-out, and so on. So long story short, and from a high level, um, we start with the identification phase where we, um, we get some kind of indication that there's an OGS installed out there in the wild. We do inspection, uh, which just gets some basic details about what that installation is and confirms that it's accessible to us uh, on the public web. There's a deduplication phase, which I'll pass to Jonas to speak about in a second. Um, there's location where we identify uh, ISSNs and countries and so on. And then we do a bit of filtering to make sure that the, um, the results are, are relevant and not things like test sets. Uh, this code is all available at, uh, on, on our SFU GitLab, by the way. So you can look at the way that this happens in practice. Um, OK, so this is the telemetry part. And um, this is where there is communication between the OGS install and the um, PKP website. Essentially, going back to uh, many, many releases ago, there's a small bit of communication between uh, OGS and PKP where the software checks to see if there's a newer version available. And if there is, it presents a notice saying you might want to consider upgrading. So that exchange already happens. And what we did starting with OGS 237, I believe it was uh, a number of years ago, is to, um, to add an additional piece of information to that. Basically, when the OGS installation gets from the PKP website, what the newest version of OGS is, it also adds its OAI URL. And uh, you can see that here, OAI URL. And I don't see it in the example here, but there's also a statistics ID, which uh, is used to help disambiguate. And that's it. Um, with the OAI PMH interface, that's an interface that we can use to query um, submission titles, uh, the article, uh, the journal title, that sort of thing. And that's a public interface in most cases. Uh, folks want to be able to use that to then harvest to third party indexes and all that sort of thing. Um, and if we have the OIR URL, then we can contact that interface and use it to um, collect information from the OGS install. But that complete exchange is public data. So we're not violating privacy. We're not going behind the scenes to use a channel to collect information from the install that's not otherwise available. And no other data is exchanged. So after the, in, the identification process uh, has occurred, we have access to the installs OEI interface, if that's the mid public. And that we can use to then list uh, journals, we can list um, sections within a journal. And most importantly, you can do things like query about you know, contact information for the administrator and list the articles and so on within that uh, installation. So once we have that centralized within PKP, we can then query all sorts of things and analyze that information through the public interface. 
Uh, I'm going to pass to Jonas to talk about a couple of the really tricky aspects here, uh, starting with deduplication. Jonas, go for it. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, so this year I was assigned to the task of completing the work that Alec and others had started a long time ago. <laughs> I don't know when. <laughs> uh, so, well, since Alec has already covered the basics of how the beacon works, I'll just explain uh, some of the challenges that we had and how we solved them. Uh, so the main, the main problem that, that we had is about consolidating duplicated data. Uh, as Alec just mentioned, it, our discovery system is based on accessing random sites that contact us looking for updates, and then we harvest them back through the OAI endpoints. Uh, so it's like one journal contact us, and then through the OAI endpoint, we can access all the journals that are hosted in the installation. So in, in our server, we periodically harvest all these installations uh, that we found in our log and store their journals together with the metadata of each public publication. Uh, this, is, this is useful to build some statistics uh, that will help us to take decisions. I think it will be shown in the next slides. So uh, the problem of duplicated data arises when, like, for, for example, we receive different OAI endpoints that in fact refer to the same installation. Uh, this condition may, might happen, for example, when a journal is served through more than one domain. So, and then both of these domains attempt to contact us like abc.com and 123.com, but in fact, they are the same journal. They just have different URLs. So after harvesting them, we end up with a lot of duplicated journals, because we are trying to harvest the same installation. <laughs> uh, there are other situations that might trigger this problem, uh, but I will skip for now, just to keep it short. Uh, so in order to have a clean and trustful numbers, we need to inspect if these new entries are really new or not. And if they are not, we need to consolidate with the data that we already have in our servers. Uh, I just can say that without this process, we would mistakenly assume that OGS is running more than 110,000 journals, which is not true. Uh, so in order to deduplicate, we look at some key information provided by the OER interface, which are li less likely to be duplicated across the different journals. Uh, for example, the unique identifier of the installation, this is provided when the journal is looking for the updates. It's sending an ID that's generated for each installation. Uh, so if this ID has its unit, we know if it's the same installation or not. Uh, the ISSN of the journal, the domain, the date time of the first publication, the administrator mail, and the repository name. It's just a kind of title that we can assign to the installation in OGS. So if this information in hands, we consider if two journals are duplicated, if they have the same ISSN, or if the journal title or the set spec is the same. And also if they have the at least two matching uh, like of the, the fields that I told before. You know, they should have like at least the same domain and the same uh, uh, stats ID, which is our unique ID. This mm -hmm. okay. So, yeah, that's how we did the page. Uh, the bottom part of the slide about choosing a leader, it's mostly related to performance. Uh, at, in case we know 10 journals are duplicated, so we don't need to harvest the publications for all of them. You just uh, overload the server of the clients. So, instead of doing this, we need to choose a leader between the duplicate, duplicates. So by the full, the first discovered journal is placed as leader and to remain this way until it becomes unresponsible, unresponsive. We consider the journals unresponsive after something like 30 days that we try to reach them and harvest and there's no answer. Or if the journal gets removed by the installation or also can be manually disabled by us. So when it happens, we need to select a new leader using the list. Uh, it's in the slide there. The journal is already leader, the installation is undisabled, the journal is undisabled or removed. So the first journal that fits in one of these conditions is chosen as the new leader. Uh, yeah, that's, I think it, that's all. We can move to the next slide. <laughs> 
so the other problem that we have is that we would like to know where our users are located. We could probably use the language of the articles, but it's not possible to assume that a journal belongs to the United States just because it has articles in English. So at this moment, we are attempting to discover the journal location by checking the metadata assigned to the ISSN. Uh, this is provided to us by a public API. Uh, so if this in hand, we are able to retrieve a mark country codes, which we then convert to ISO. But this mapping isn't, isn't perfect because some countries from MARC that don't exist in ISO due, due to political conflicts and such things. Uh, also, not all journals have uh, ISSN specified. So in order to fill the gap, we decided to fall back the location to the top level domain of the journal. So if a journal is hosted under abc.br, we consider it's from Brazil. It's abc.ca, we consider it's from Canada, and so on. Uh, but it also doesn't work for everybody because there's some domains that don't refer to no country at all, like .com. So then, uh, as a last fallback, we are using the geolocation of the server, which works well for most of the cases, I think, but isn't perfect because uh, anybody can host a site in another country. Uh, I think that's all for this slide. Uh, to move to the next. <laughs> so about the filtering, another problem that we had is that we found a lot of test installations, uh, internet hosts and such things. And I think we shouldn't count them because they are not real. <laughs> uh, to solve this problem, we adopted some steps. Uh, first, we, when looking for installations in the server log, we ignore all journals that refer to invalid domains such as local host, uh, internet hosts, and etc. We try to reverse, to resolve the, the host to the IP. If it doesn't work, it means it probably doesn't exist. <laughs> and also we ignore uh, fixed IP addresses. Uh, yeah, that's all for the host. As a second step, we also ignore journals and installations that have some keywords in their title, like such as test, dev, demo, them and other keywords that we consider related to uh, fake journals or just like a CISA domain testing a new version of OGS. So we are also not counting these journals. Uh, and the last filter in this slide uh, refers to the map generation that will be displayed later in these slides. Uh, so the beacon is able to identify all the softwares that we, we make this OGS or OMP and OPS, but for the map, we are only generating uh, statistics, statistics based on OGS. Uh, we are just taking the journals that we consider to be active. Uh, and we consider a journal is active if it has at least five published articles in a given year. And also it should have been online and not failing to be harvested in the last 30 days. Uh, I think that's all. <laughs> Thanks, Jonas. Um, yeah, and as I say, there's a link to the code. I think uh, Juan shared that on the chat as well. Um, there's lots of details there. Um, this is one of those projects that started out as a small task and became much more complicated. And Jonas's work on this has been really invaluable in making sure that we're confident that the results are, are accurate. So we're on to the fun stuff now, which is the results. And the banner number here is that we currently measure over 25,000 actively publishing journals using OJS, um, where actively publishing means that there's um, at least five journals published in the last uh, year. Um, the previous estimate we had for community done with a, an earlier revision of this, but uh, that was much less effective, had us at around 10,000. And that number already felt very prominent uh, to us. Um, so the, 20, the 25,000 more than doubled our uh, previous estimate. We've done a lot of work to try to make sure that we have confidence in this number because it's so large. And that's what you're seeing reflected in all these various filters and, uh, and disambiguation uh, attempts. But what we're doing is we're publishing this as a, a public open data set so that we can kind of crowdsource for the research, um, for the validation and, uh, and make this kind of resource available um, to folks who, who might be able to make use of it. 
but yeah, 25,000, I believe that makes OJS the, the largest academic journal publishing platform uh, by far uh, globally. So data set link is down there and um, uh, I'll come to a, a URL for this at the end that you can click on once I publish the slides as well. So uh, watch for those to be shared also on Twitter. I want to see I posted that. The, I posted the link to the data set in the chat as well for people that are, that are curious. Sounds good. Okay, so let's break this down into a few different categories of results. And for that, I'll pass over to Sorab. Great. Thanks, Alec. Uh, uh, so I've been working very closely with uh, John Walensky here at Stanford on uh, assessing the global outreach and growth of OJS. And as Alec mentioned, it's very impressive that we have more than 25,000 journals actively using OJS. And like for the year 2020, we had the number roughly around uh, 25,600 or so. And as Alec mentioned again, uh, we define activity at the annual level. More specifically, we define an active journal as one that publishes at least five articles in a given calendar year. Uh, if you look at the data set that we have published, we have uh, a fair amount of inactive journals as well, uh, around 19,000 or so. So these are the journals that have used OGS to publish at least one article, but they do not maintain productivity at the level of at least five articles in a given calendar year. So uh, in terms of uh, the geographical spread, let's, let's first consider the geographic spread of OJS users and how this geographic spread has evolved over the last decade. So we can go to the next slide. Great, so, so the map that you see here uh, shows the global outreach of OJS for the year 2021. We also have a dynamic map at the link shown on this slide, which shows the impressive growth of OGS from around 3,000 active journals in 2010 to more than 25,000 at present. And so as you can see on this map, the intensity of the color shows larger presence in terms of journal count for a given country. And the color palettes that we have, they indicate eight global regions as we see here in the legend on the left side. The numbers uh, show that we have an impressively strong presence in East Asia and Pacific, especially around 2021. And this is followed by a fairly strong presence in both Latin America, as well as Europe and Central Asia. Okay, we can go to the next one. So the growth becomes much more tangible here. This is a bar chart showing the growth of journals using OJS over the last decade. The bars are stacked by the eight regions we saw in the map as well. So we can see that we started pretty strong in Latin America, which is the yellow stack and uh, Europe and Central Asia, which is the orange stack, which was around 3000 or so journals using OJS in 2010. And the growth for both these regions has been fairly steady. Uh, we didn't start that big in East Asia and Pacific, which is the green stack, but we have had exemplary growth in this region. And in the last five years, we also see significant growth in South Asia and uh, North America, which are the maroon and the light blue stacks at the top. Let's move uh, to looking at these numbers by country as well. So we can go to the next slide, Alec. So if we switch focus from regions to the top 10 countries using OJS, we see that uh, uh, there are, so there are two countries that clearly stand out. The, uh, the first one is Indonesia, and this is uh, the country that's driving the impressive growth of OJS usage in the East Asia region. Uh, and we have almost uh, 12,000 journals actively using OJS at present in Indonesia. And for Brazil, this number is around 2,500. And uh, you can see at the legend in the bottom, the countries are mentioned in descending order of journal count. So Indonesia is at the top, followed by Brazil, followed by the US, followed by Spain. And finally, the 10th one is Poland. Uh, and uh, I think uh, like, uh, these numbers show that uh, like, even for the cluster at the bottom, like, even though like, uh, the growth of Indonesia and Brazil kind of uh, compresses that part of the chart, but if we zoom in, we see that 
there has been impressive growth in these other eight countries as well. Okay, we can move to the next slide. And now uh, moving from journals to the number of articles published, we see a very similar trend uh, in that, that follows the growth of articles from 2010 to 2021. Uh, so we have more than 6 million articles published in the last decade on OGS journals. And uh, this figure includes articles published in all OGS journals and not just the active journals. So this includes inactive journals as well, where these journals might have at least uh, one article overall, but they are not publishing as productively as five articles in a given calendar year. So those are also contributing to this number. And overall, cumulatively, we have more than 6 million articles in the last decade. And I'll pass it on to Alec for the results in terms of software version of OGS. Thanks, Sarah. And just a note on the, uh, on the drop off at the end here, of course, the 2021 calendar year is not complete. But the way that we're doing these dates is by the article's publication date. And so you can expect that through the year 2022, you'll see continued contributions to the 2021 year. Uh, also, there's a, a large contribution of folks doing retroactive publications, so back issues. And so we, for the last few years, we've been doing these sorts of numbers. We've seen this characteristic kind of crest and uh, we've decided that the time at which we announce the total number for a year is actually six months into the subsequent year. So it'll be uh, June, 2022, before we consider 2021 numbers to have kind of stabilized. All right. so. Um, I, one of my hats that I wear is um, as the kind of lead of the development team of OGS. And so what's of interest to me is um, software versions out there, what, what people are using, how old it is, uh, and how those kind of distributions cluster. Um, if I want to look at the results that we see from this data set by major software version, you can see um, what you might expect if you've been kind of trying to do an OGS 2 to OGS 3 upgrade, which is that there's some folks who are still using OGS 2, in fact, quite a number and then uh, a bit of a, a gap in the early OGS 3 release, and then a, a bit of a cluster here for the OGS 3.1, 3.2, and 3.3 releases. Um, what this says to me as a software developer is that we still have a fairly large community still using OGS 2, which is surprising considering it's past its end of life. Uh, so, so why would that be? Uh, I'll come back to that in a second. Um, one practical implication is that we have a very small community that's using OGS 3.0.x, and so, we can decide that at this point, it's safe to remove the upgrade scripts from 3.0x to 3.4x, for example. Any folks who are still using 3.0x uh, can go via an intermediate upgrade, but we won't be impacting a large community if we uh, remove that support. And that helps us to kind of keep our, our the code responsible for as trim as possible, which is a constant struggle for us. Uh, looking at a, um, a more specific graph of the different versions, this is all the different releases of the software, uh, not categorized to major releases. Um, and again, to come back to that question of, um, well, first of all, it's a lot of different releases to be responsible for. And of course, if there are security issues, for example, that come up, um, then it's concerning because it means that folks aren't necessarily keeping up to date. I think that's reflective of the nature of our community where they are often grassroots journals who don't have a lot of institutional support, may not have a lot of technical resources, and are simply kind of trying to install something and work with it. Um, it also suggests that we may, may need to improve our upgrade tool set to make it uh, more easy for them to do that, which we're definitely investing some effort into. Um, so we have a major kind of clump at each release. And as I mentioned, that suggests to me that upgrades are a challenge, either for resourcing or because the tool set's too complicated. And I suspect there's a story in each of those. Um, to look at the OGS2 question, um, when you see a, a cluster like this bell curve on OGS2.x, that suggests to me that these folks have probably never upgraded. They probably just installed what, what was uh, most recent at the time and have just kept using it. But then you have this little spike here at the most recent 2.x install, which suggests to me that those folks have kept up to date with OGS2.x, the upgraded to the most recent release, but have not yet managed to make the leap to OGS3. And that could again be technical, it could be because they've got to retrain their editors. It could be because they're happy with OGS2 in some cases, et cetera. Um, right, so I'm gonna move from there to some areas of future research and, uh, and germinal stuff. And I think for that, I'm gonna pass the first slide off to John Ball. Great. Hi everyone, my name is John. Like Sarab, I'm a PhD student at Stanford. I'm working with John Walensky. Um, I fully encourage you to check out the link that Juan put in the chat. 
to the Dataverse data set, share it widely, we're going to plug it because there's a lot of really interesting insights that can be drawn from that in a sociology of knowledge field. So Sarab and I were yesterday, were scraping through some of the websites for the journals. We were finding out languages, for example, incredible linguistic diversity, perhaps half are monolingual English journals, but that means half aren't. Dozens of languages represented around the world. Uh, one question I've been trying to answer is about the distribution of academic disciplines in the journals. So using a neural net to predict disciplines, what would that look like? We're thinking maybe a third are in science and technology. Um, so Rob also mentioned the uh, explosion in Indonesian contexts in journals. Um, there's a lot of collaboration between Indonesia, India, other countries in uh, the East and uh, South Asian area. Um, and there's indications that the Indonesian government and the Ministry of Higher Education and Innovation and Technology is really positioning itself to be a leader in academic production in the future. And they maintain a ranking of top academic journals and most of those are running on OJS. So OJS is going to play a big role in this academic publishing boom. And it'll be interesting to trace what the causes and what the effects of that are going forward. So I fully encourage you to go and check out the data set. A lot of interesting insights can be drawn from that. Um, and Alec wants to talk a bit more about software side research. Um, yeah. And this is actually kind of the fun part now that we've got this wild and woolly data set kind of wrangled into a shape where research can be done. Um, there's a ton of opportunities for that research. And I just wanted to say um, the international aspect here is no surprise, it's no coincidence. Um, we, we did a lot of work trying to make sure that we were um, uh, targeting um, open access publications in places that were underserved uh, by the kind of traditional vendors. And the response from that community has just really defined PKP in, in a huge way. The work in Brazil um, and Latin America, um, the Asian Journals Online project and African Journals Online projects, those were our early year success stories. And I think the emphasis on multilingual capabilities and international community um, that you're seeing in this data comes from those grassroots uh, initiatives to try and start publication. And now we're seeing um, frankly, parts of, for example, North America have to start paying more attention to that because um, they weren't the early adopters. And uh, now there's a community that's really kind of too large to ignore. So I know a lot of the folks here um, on this call have been active in some of those, those aspects. And so I really want to say thank you to you for your continuing support in uh, helping to, to, to make sure this software is used widely and is um, translated and, uh, and contributed to as an open source project. Um, so we know there are other translation communities in the wild. And when I say translations, um, typically a translation takes effort, of course, to maintain and to produce. So where there's a translation, there's a community. And so if we're able to look at what uh, languages are out there in OGS that we haven't been in contact with, um, we'll be able to find probably a, a community of support. That might be an institution that's got some resources. It might be uh, a, uh, a coalition, a, pri a private publishing enterprise, or even the government. Um, so that's where we could look for some additional community building and uh, hopefully uh, from there, from translations into things like, you know, open source software contributions. Um, there's also a lot of interesting kinds of content uh, stored in OJS and OMP and OPS. Um, the ones that we're aware of, for example, are people using OJS to adjudicate grants. So they might um, receive grant submissions. They might use the peer review tools to, uh, to vet those grants. And there's a, a form tool set you can use to configure uh, whatever he looks like, and that's suitable for grant adjudication. Um, I know that there's a couple of journals out there that use OGS for publishing uh, fiction. There's one old example called The Harrow, which publishes uh, horror fiction, which was uh, really interesting years ago to see um, the scholarly publication software being used for, for that purpose. Um, and uh, as an institutional repository, and uh, none of these are, are, are things that I would necessarily advocate <laughs> using OGS for. But it is used for that because it, it is centered around a workflow, uh, a peer review tool set. Um, so yeah, we could study more of that. Um, one thing that we're going to be working on in the very near future is integrity. We've received a, a contribution from a donor to study journal integrity and look at tools to try to um, approach the usage of OGS for uh, predatory or cloning type activities. Um, and it's interesting because the disambiguation tools that Jonas presented earlier 
can actually be used to distinguish uh, a clone journal from uh, from its 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 actual counterpart. In a way, we could look at titles that match two journals where the two are clearly not the same thing and say, well, are these now clones? And some of the clones that I've seen, I've only seen a few of them, but people obviously put a lot of work into trying to make them look as close to the, the source journal as possible, which is um, it's a lot of effort. Um, there's the data set published there and there's the map. And I'd like to move on to uh, questions. Um, and yeah, happy to cover those on the results, on the data set, on the methodology we used, on the subject of telemetry, any of those things are open. So uh, please, if you have any questions, uh, ask us in the chat. I just turn off your sharing, Alex, just so they can see our big faces. Uh, what is the current thinking around help with upgrading? Yeah, um, there's two perspectives on the team, um, I would say about that. And I'm, I'm the bad cop. My perspective is that uh, OGS3 has been out there for long enough that OGS2, people are gonna leap or they're not. And uh, there's only a limited amount that we can do to facilitate that. However, uh, there is, as we saw in the graph, a very large OGS2 community. And there obviously is uh, some outreach and some help that needs to be done there. So we have to figure out a way to balance our, our efforts so that we're facilitating upgrades so people stay current against just the size of that community, which makes it really complicated. And the longer that that, that upgrade gap persists between what people are currently running and what's new, the harder it gets to upgrade. So that's my short answer. I will say that we're investing a lot of effort right now on the dev team into making upgrades more reliable and less complicated. And the challenge is that that's only gonna go for the new, like the 3.3.0 releases, for example, and forward. So if you have uh, an OGS install that's running something older than that, you still have to jump through some hoops to get there. But once you're at that point, we're really hoping to have things uh, stay more current. We're also talking about an LTS release model um, within the, uh, the OGS uh, team and the technical committee. And essentially what that is, is designating uh, a line of OGS releases as long-term support. And so um, an institution that's running OGS can say, okay, this is gonna be a reliable maintained uh, version of OGS that we can take and trust and use for three to five years. And at the end of that three to five year period, there's gonna be an easy upgrade process from there to the next LTS. So we're tackling this in a bunch of different ways. Um, happy to talk more about that too. I'll add one more little bit on that is that part of this actual work of when we were validating this data, so we did do actually grabbing some country samples of the data and then had uh, folks actually go through those journals and people that knew the local context go through them. Um, and that's led to some conversations with, uh, you know, I know that in the Latin American context, we've had um, Alejandra, who is, uh, uh, has been doing an internship with PKP, has uh, been speaking to those journals and trying to actually ask some questions like what has been the challenge around upgrading? Um, and, and so we are trying to sort of create some of that under, like that knowledge that um, around what could we do to help support them. And a lot of the times they're institutional challenges and they're not, they're not technical ones. And so the question is how can those services be available to, to the journals in place? But that, having this data has actually been very helpful in this regard of actually being able to document this release. So that, you know, that data showing the release patterns as Alex showed uh, was quite um, helpful in knowing, okay, well, this is this is the, where the journals that are being left behind. It's also allowed us to actually reach out to journals who haven't upgraded, right? So we can actually, we have a list of these now and say, oh, this journal is on this old version of OJS. We can reach out to them and, and find out what it is that they might uh, be able to um, do to get them to a more recent release. Uh, Maria is asking about interest from specific countries to see how many OGS journals published there. Um, how would they obtain information and how would I suggest they access and filter the Beacon data set? Um, so the data set is in the chat, it's shared publicly and that's on uh, the Skullcom Labs uh, Dataverse and that will be updated. We're planning on updating that data sort of every, every year. That's the complete data set. It's, it's the list of all of the, the different, um, that's, more, that's more than 25,000 uh, installations. Uh, I'd have to guess the total number of rows there. Um, so if you want to see, for example, for France, for you know, South Africa, you can simply look at that spreadsheet and then remove anything that's not the country of interest. We've never published that before. We've always maintained kind of a, an uncertain internal list simply because that data has been so hard to wrangle that we've not had much confidence in its quality. And sometimes when folks have asked us, you know, who's in Belgium, who should we talk to? Uh, we've given them a subset of that data, but it's now published and that's literally published, I think yesterday was when it finally came through. Um, for the first time. So that'd be put it online, yeah, last night I hit the publish button. Um, 
I think the, the answer is that we didn't, we weren't confident in our data. And now we feel confident that we've at least made the process. And this is why all those details in the first half hour of this presentation was on those details, because we wanted to be transparent about there's some limitations and challenges of doing this kind of work. And we wanted to make sure that that was clear. Um, we've tried to document that there is a data dictionary and methodological notes that's accompanying that data set um, that explains which fields you might want to filter on if you're wanting to select. Uh, and to answer Pablo's question, actually, that data set actually includes all of the instances of all PKP software. And so it includes the, the OPS and OMP instances as well, um, using the same filters, uh, sorry, using the same uh, methodology to apply. And the data set doesn't have any filtering so that there's no criteria around uh, the number of installations, the way that um, uh, the number of articles published, um, but you have that that information there. So you can um, apply whatever filter you would like to for, for your purposes. There's actually two tabular data sets in the, in the, the Dataverse uh, deposit. One is the, the longer list and that's OGS, OMP and OPS, and it's less filtering. Then there's one that's sourced, that's sourced for the map and the map is only OGS. And so it filters the OGS stuff. So look for the bigger one of the two and you'll get everything. Anybody else uh, with another question? I think with that, then maybe we can uh, we can wrap it up. Uh, we will be recording. We have recorded this presentation, so we'll make it available. If there's anything that you want to go back and, and review, um, the, the slides themselves are available actually as part of the data set. And, uh, and the data set, like I said, the methodological notes that are there explain a lot of the process. And you can also click through to the links to the actual code itself. Um, so you can, uh, if there's any particular detail that you want to uh, to confirm or otherwise also, we're always happy to receive uh, the query and, and help to respond. So um, uh, so thanks again for, for, for your interest and for being here. And thanks, I, let me also just take the chance to publicly thank both uh, uh, Saurabh, John and Jonas uh, for their hard and diligent work on all of this. Um, uh, in particular, Jonas and Sarab, who have been on it for a long slog, and then John has come on now and helping us to really make use of all of these things. So, so a, a public thank you uh, to the three of them. Uh, uh, so with that, I think we can uh, sign off for now. Thanks, everyone. Take care.